Hello everyone, and as you can see from the images at the top, today we're looking at the history of atomic theory. And these are the various different models of the atom that we've come up with over the years. But the history of atoms has been one of those voyages of discovery, one of those things that different people down the centuries have contributed to and helped to build up the idea of atoms as we see them today. And we're going to introduce some of these men now. Sorry, ladies, but they are all men. Historically, women have not been allowed to get involved in science. And when they have, they have had their contributions overlooked and ignored all too often. So hopefully the future will hold different things in that regard. So we're going to start with Democritus back in ancient Greece, and he was born in Thrace, which is an area that covers parts of modern day Greece, Bulgaria and Turkey. He was apparently known as an easygoing and friendly person, although we don't know that much about the pre-Socratic philosophers. However, his ideas, although influential in his day, were not liked by everyone. Plato, one of the most famous philosophers of ancient Greece, especially was not a fan of Democritus. However, his ideas about atoms were not experimental. He didn't have any experiments. His ideas came from conversations between him and his teacher, Leucippus, and their atoms were solid lumps of matter that interacted mechanically. So, for example, a atom of metal might be a very, very, very tiny piece of metal, just the same as a larger piece, but this would be the smallest piece that you could get. And they might have little hooks on them, for example, so that single atoms of metal could hook together and connect into make larger lumps of metal. So the Democritean atom was very much a tiny little mechanical device. We're moving on to 1743. So it took nearly 2000 years for atomic theory to move on. Although given that you cannot see atoms, this is perhaps not surprising. It's not that we didn't have any ideas in the meantime. It's just that we couldn't really do anything about them. Then came Antoine Lavoisier. He was a rich French man and he used that wealth to conduct many new experiments in the area of science and especially chemistry. Unfortunately for him, his lifestyle as a rich man and he was also a tax collector led to him being executed during the French Revolution, although they did say sorry later. How nice of them. So as I said, Lavoisier did many experiments that demonstrated that chemistry was very much a quantitative subject. Before him, all the alchemists had played around with chemicals, but none of them had latched on to the idea that you can make precise calculations about chemical reactions and you can know exactly what your outputs will be. So Lavoisier showed that in any reaction, you have the same mass before and after the reaction, even if some of that mass is, say, transformed into smoke, for example, or even some other intangible form. This is called the law of conservation of mass, which was in those days called Lavoisier's law. On top of that, he discovered hydrogen and oxygen, and he noticed that oxygen was very important in combustion or burning. And this led to the downfall of phlogiston theory. Until that time, people thought that burning happened because of some burnable substance called phlogiston that was found in anything that could burn. Following on from Lavoisier came Joseph Proust from France as well. And he was trained as an apothecary, which is like an early pharmacist, a medicine man. He worked in Spain as well as France, and he continued his chemical studies throughout his career. His belief in definite proportions did not sit well with everyone at that time. But by comparing copper carbonate from various different places, Proust was able to show that doesn't matter where you get your copper carbonate from, you will always get exactly the same amount of copper and carbon and oxygen from any sample you might find. And this was called Proust's law, although we now know it as the law of definite proportions. 
Next came John Dalton, an English school teacher, and he was a quiet man and described by some of his other contemporary scientists as a very coarse experimenter, meaning that he was not terribly precise when he ran experiments. He was a Quaker, a kind of Christian, and something else he did in his life was to estimate the heights of various different mountains in the English Lake District where he was born. So he was the first to propose modern atomic theory in the sense that each element is made of an atom and all atoms of any one element are indivisible and identical. Democritus would probably have agreed with that statement. However, by this time, we knew that atoms were more than just very, very small lumps of exactly the same substance. He also observed that definite proportions, such as those Proust has observed, can always be reduced to whole number ratios. So, for example, a molecule of water contains one oxygen and two hydrogen, and it's always one to two simple whole number ratios. Although Dalton himself would not have agreed with the idea of molecules such as those that make up water. Next on our list is Joseph Louis Gay Lussac from France, and he was the son of a doctor and a landowner. He was another French aristocrat, but fortunately for him, he survived. The French Revolution. And it was him who discovered the famous H2O relationship in water. Water is two parts hydrogen to every one part oxygen. He also tested the atmosphere, taking samples at different altitudes from a hot air balloon, and he reached a height of 7,000 meters, which was the highest anyone had been at that time. So, Lussac was the first to start drawing this connection between the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas. So, gases, when you have them in something, if you increase the temperature, they have a greater pressure on the inside of the container, if that container is a fixed volume. To state it formally, the law states that if mass and volume are held constant, then the gas pressure increases linearly as the temperature rises. So this is a simple equation like all linear relations, and it required accurate equipment in order to take this kind of data. He needed carefully controlled conditions, and as a side of this, Lussac also realized that if you take oxygen, and you go through some reaction to turn all of that oxygen gas into water vapor, gaseous water, you will have twice the volume of water vapor as you originally had of oxygen. And that suggests that oxygen is dividing into two somehow. Of course, we now know that a molecule of oxygen gas is O2. But many people in that time did not believe this. Dalton, for example, never believed in molecules, and Lussac was one of the first to show the evidence for the existence of something other than simple atoms. Someone who very much did believe in molecules was Amadeo Avogadro from Italy. So he lived in Turin, and he seems to have been a fairly quiet man. He involved himself in politics, though, and this led to him losing his job on a couple of occasions. His theories on the mass of gases was not immediately accepted by scientists until after his death, possibly because, as you might have noticed, all of the chemical discovery at this time was really taking place in France and England, and Italy was not really thought of as a pioneer of scientific theory. However, Avogadro suggested something that Dalton, for example, would never accept. Molecules. The idea that some atoms connect together and they go around in everyday life as molecules, such as O2, two oxygen atoms wandering around joined together. He was also the first to suggest that maybe at a constant temperature and pressure, an equal volume 
of a gas will contain an equal number of molecules. And we now know that this is true and we call it Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And that is the number of molecules you will find in one mole of any substance. A mole is a SI unit of quantity. Next we come to Dmitry Mendeleev from Russia, and although he didn't really contribute to atomic theory as such, he did contribute to the way we organize and think about atoms, and that was in his design of the periodic table. His scientific mind was noticed by his mother very early in his life, and she traveled vast distances with him to get him into a good college, which he eventually did. Later in life, he married and then subsequently divorced, and even though the Russian Orthodox Church required that he wait seven years before remarrying, he didn't care about that, he just got married again straight away. But, because he was such a brilliant scientist, he was able to get away with this, the powerful church could not touch him because the Tsar of Russia, the king of Russia essentially, was protecting him because he was such a brilliant scientist. So he organized the periodic table of elements into the format roughly in which we see it today, although we have added to it over the years. There are various different arrangements of the elements that make sense, but Mendeleev was, had such a brilliant understanding of the subject that his expertise, and therefore his periodic table, were the one that got recognized by the scientific community at large. And we're just going to have a quick look at that table now before we proceed. So here's the table, and it was arranged into vertical groups and horizontal periods. And the periods are connected to the filling of electron shells, although Mendeleev would never have realized this at the time. Mendeleev, in fact, would not have believed in electrons. He wouldn't believe in anything he couldn't, in principle, see. However, the vertical groups have various different names, and we're going to go through a few of those now very quickly. So, the far left group is called the alkali metals, and next to them we have the related but slightly different alkaline earth metals. Those are group 2. Groups 3 through 12 on the table are the transition metals, and these are all the metals which we think of as metals. Iron, gold, silver, copper, zinc, all the metals that we know from everyday life are in this block, and this is where all the conducting metals are found for the most part. And after the metals, we have the non-metals, although some of them are metalloids, elements with the qualities of both metals and non-metals. This is a bit of a weird mixed group, but you may notice that all of the organic chemicals are found here. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, sulfur, phosphorus, all of those are found in this part of the periodic table. And just before we reach the end of the table, we have the halogens, which are a highly reactive group of elements at the right-hand side. And then we finally have, on the far right, the noble gases. These are completely unreactive elements, and in fact, they probably would not have been known about in Mendeleev's day. I say finally, but we actually have one more group to look at, and those are the lanthanides and actinides, which are found at the bottom. They are in many ways an extension of the transition metals. They fit in between group 2 and the transition metals, but we put them down at the bottom for convenience, because otherwise the table would be far too long to put into textbooks. So let's just go over those groups again very quickly. So as I said, the table is divided into horizontal periods, and those are arranged to match the filling of electron shells. But this is something that Mendeleev would not have known about. However, he did know about the vertical groups, and this is because they are grouped according to similar chemical characteristics. 
This is also because of their electron arrangements, but again, Mendeleev would not have known about this. So on the far left, we have the alkali metals. They are all soft and shiny. They react very easily because they have one spare electron that they really want to get rid of. In particular, they react very well with water. These are metals which burst into flame and explode when you put them in water. Slightly less exciting are the alkaline earth metals. They are again silvery and quite reactive, although not as reactive as group one. They're also slightly harder than the alkali metals. So the big block in the middle is the transition metals. There are many different elements in this group, but they all have these partially filled electron shells, which means they have some spare electrons that can be used for reacting or for passing on electric charge. And most of the metals we use as electrical conductors are found in the transition metals. The non-metals and metalloids have many different types of element in. The, some of them are metallic, but they do not count as metals. Some of them are metals, and some of them clearly do not have any metallic qualities at all. In particular, the organic elements are found in this part of the table. As I said before, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Before we reach the end, we find the halogens, which are highly reactive non-metals. Most of them are gases at normal temperatures, and they are like the alkali metals, but at this time they are missing one electron instead of having one spare. And this means they react very well with the alkali metals. In fact, you might see that Na in group one is sodium. This is a very reactive metal that explodes in water. And then Cl in group 17 is chlorine, one of the halogens, which is a very poisonous gas if you breathe it in. However, if Na and Cl react, they create NaCl or sodium chloride, which is otherwise known as table salt, which you can put on your french fries to make them extra delicious. But don't use too much. It's bad for you, you know. Group 8 is the noble gases. These gases are completely stable because they have a full electron shell. They don't want any more electrons and they don't want to get rid of any electrons. So they do not react with anything if they can avoid it. And for this reason, they were not discovered in Mendeleev's time. They would not have appeared on his original table. And then finally, down the bottom, the lanthanides and actinides. They are an extension of the transition metals, tend to be silvery in appearance, but they are much bigger atoms overall. And we put them down the bottom to make the table more convenient. So let's return to atomic theory and Joseph John Thomson, an English physicist. And here you'll begin to see that the discovery of atomic theory shifts from the chemists who had been doing all the work previously to the physicists who will do all the work from here on. J.J. Thomson came from Manchester in the Midlands of England. He went on to become a professor at Cambridge, and one of his students was Ernest Rutherford, who would later hold the same job. He received a Nobel Prize for his work, and his work was proving that electrons exist. So he showed that cathode rays, which are energy beams from the positive electrode, these were negatively charged particles, and he did this by putting the cathode ray beam through a magnetic and an electric field, and he realized that this beam was attracted towards the positive diode, electrode of an electric field. So, as you may know, positive attracts negative, so that showed that the cathode ray was negative. And he also discovered the charge to mass ratio of an electron. So if you had a certain amount, say one gram of this, these cathode ray particles, he, would, he showed what amount. So if you had, say, one gram of these cathode ray particles, he showed how much electrical charge you would have. 
and it was a lot. However, he was not able to discover the mass of a single electron or the individual charge on a single electron. However, his work did lead him to develop the plum pudding model of the atom, and this shows the atom as a solid positive lump, and inside that the electrons are placed as negative charges, kind of like plums in a plum pudding, so in a Christmas pudding sort of spread out throughout the positive charge that was the atom as a whole. Next came Robert Millikan from the United States. So he was a professor at the University of Chicago and went on to become a director of the very famous and prestigious Caltech. He helped to write several books on education, but he also was able to work out what the charge on an electron was. He was able to do this by creating drops of oil and putting them into an ionized gas so that they attracted ions of gas and became charged drops of oil. Charged oil drops. So, with these charged oil drops, Millikan then applied an electric field and he was able to balance the force of gravity acting downwards on these oil drops with the electric force acting in the other direction because of the charge on the drops. He was actually able to balance these forces and levitate a drop in mid-air. Now, this is a pretty cool thing to be able to do, but beyond that, it allowed him to calculate the charge on a single electron. So, he knew the mass of the oil drop, he knew the strength of gravity, and he knew the strength of the electric field. With all of this information, he is able to calculate the charge on a single drop. Each drop has a different charge on it, it's true, but Millikan noticed something that was very important. Whatever drop he tried, it was always a whole number multiple. The charge on that drop was always a whole number multiple of the charge of a fixed minimum value, and that value was 1.602 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs and he deducted that this was the fundamental unit of charge, the amount of charge you would get on a proton or an electron. Of course, electrons being negatively charged would have a charge of minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So next came Ernest Rutherford, hailing from New Zealand, but he spent a lot of his working life in the UK and Canada. He worked on various different areas of science, but he's best remembered for discovering the nucleus. So he analyzed the scattering of positively charged alpha particles hitting gold foil. And what he realized is most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold foil. They did not get scattered, or they were scattered by only a very small amount. Now, you may remember that the plum pudding model of the atom, the model that was most accepted at that time, had the atom as a solid positive lump with little negative electrons spread through it. However, Rutherford did not see an effect tracked with this. If the atom was a solid positive lump, surely all the alpha particles would scatter backwards away from the gold foil when they came close to the positively charged atoms that it was made of. But they didn't. They went straight through for the most part. Very, very few atoms were scattered backwards towards the detector, and this suggested to Rutherford that all of the positive part of an atom was concentrated in one very small part. And he put this in the center of the atomic model, and he called it the nucleus. And so he had really discovered the positive nucleus of the atoms, and you may know the nucleus is 
is made from protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which have no charge. So overall, the nucleus of an atom is positive. And then the electrons, the negative charges, occupy the empty space that is outside that. And so the alpha particles that were not scattered or were scattered slightly were passing through this empty space and they were not interacting with the nucleus. So next we have Niels Bohr from Denmark. So he founded a very famous institute of physics which still exists to this day. It's called the Bohr Institute and he was forced to flee Denmark unfortunately during World War II to Sweden and then to the UK and eventually to America where he worked on the Manhattan Project to develop the first nuclear bombs. He was a peaceful man. He did not believe that physics should be applied to weapons of war. However, at this time in this period of history, there was a lot of fear driven by the idea that maybe the enemy would be the first to develop nuclear bombs and that this would lead to the loss of the war. So many scientists who otherwise would never have contributed to any warlike application of science did get involved in the Manhattan Project. However, the Bohr model of the atom is what we more remember Bohr for. He was the very first to quantize electron energies into levels. So the Rutherford model of the atom had the nucleus, but then the electrons kind of just hung out in the space outside. They did not have any fixed relationship to the nucleus. Bohr suggested that the electrons orbit the nucleus, kind of like planets around the sun, and he suggested that these orbits have exact energy levels which the electrons must take on. So you can have electron energy level 1, level 2, level 3, etc. But you cannot have electron energy level 1.5 or 0.32. It just cannot happen. So the Bohr model of the atom, the solar system style model that he created, only ever exactly described hydrogen. Other elements were more complex and the Bohr model never actually quite worked. However, it was absolutely vital for bringing these first ideas about quantum physics into focus and allowing the rest of the scientific community to work out what was really going on. Albert Einstein needs no introduction. This is the one physicist that almost everyone has heard of coming from Germany. He was unable to find work after he graduated from university and indeed he spent much of his early career working in a patent office in Switzerland. In 1905 he got his PhD and he wrote four scientific papers which were among the most revolutionary of the time and this put him immediately into the upper echelon of living scientists and he stayed there until he died. He is absolutely the archetype of a genius. So Einstein was able to prove the existence of electrons once and for all and he used statistical physics to do that. Now what would statistical physics be? Well, if we think, for example, of a gas, that is a number of different molecules and atoms just floating around in space. And some of them will be going left, some right, some up, some down, some fast, some slow, etc. Now, obviously, we do not have the technology to calculate the speed and momentum and direction of all the atoms in even a tiny amount of gas. But we can apply high level statistics to get a probability of what is likely to happen in these situations. And that is what Einstein did. As you may know, he also established the equivalence of energy and matter with his famous equation E equals MC squared. He added to the particle theory of photons, establishing wave particle duality. 
In other words, he showed that photons of light behave both as waves and as particles, which is a very strange idea. And he also did many, many, many other things as well. So Louis de Broglie from France is a man who really took this idea of wave particle duality and ran with it. So he was well known by the scientists of his day and well known for his ideas about the philosophical basis of science. Some of these questions have still not been answered to this day. And he worked with Einstein's ideas of wave particle nature of photons and extended that idea to any particle of matter. In principle, any particle at all, even macroscopic particles. However, this was most readily applied to the electrons and this explained Bohr's idea of quantized energy levels by stating that electrons form standing waves around the nucleus. So instead of orbiting the nucleus in a circular path like a planet, the idea was that maybe electrons went around the nucleus in waves and that you could only have a whole number of wavelengths to bring you back to the start of an orbit. That means you have to finish the orbit with a whole number of wavelengths, one, two, three, four, etc. Now, it's still not true to say that electrons orbit like planets, even planets with wave-like orbits. However, this is a fundamental part of wave-particle duality and it explains the quantization of energy levels. And as such, de Broglie contributed to the very cornerstone of quantum physics. Finally, we have Erwin Schrödinger from Austria. He was a colorful character in his personal life and he had various problems in Europe because of his opposition to Nazi rule in Germany. Like many at that time, he later tried to appease the Nazis to kind of roll back his criticism in the hope that they would roll back their craziness. However, they didn't and he regretted his stance later. In fact, he personally apologized to Einstein for not supporting the Nazis, but not opposing them when it was most important. However, he was not alone in this mistake. Schrodinger formalized quantum mechanics for the very first time. He invented the equation that we use to describe particles in wave-like terms. This is called the Schrodinger equation for obvious reasons. He's also very well known for Schrodinger's cat, which is a metaphor, a thought experiment, which allows us to think about just how weird quantum mechanics really is. There are many places you can research Schrodinger's cat online, but the outcome of the experiment was you could have a cat which was simultaneously alive and dead. And this, of course, makes no sense to our macroscopic ideas of the world. Now, it should be said that this idea really only applies to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is one interpretation of quantum mechanics. There are other interpretations, such as, for example, the many worlds interpretation. And this does not require that you end up with a simultaneously alive and dead cat. However, the Copenhagen interpretation is still the most popular interpretation and all of the different interpretations of quantum mechanics have their own problems associated with them. So that is the end of our run through on atomic theory and I'm just going to quickly mention our current model of the atom. The Bohr model, which was the solar system-like model, was the last model, but now we use what's called the electron cloud model, which is you have a nucleus in the center, just like Rutherford's nucleus and Bohr's nucleus, but then outside that, you have a cloud of electrons. And it's really not possible to be sure where the electron is at any one time or where any electron is at any one time. It's really about probability. 
So the background you see here is a stylized image of an electron cloud model. You can see the nucleus there, although it is far too big for the true scale of the atom. And then outside that is this mess of orbitals. We still call them orbitals, even though we know that electrons do not orbit in circles. There are none of these rings that you see there. There's just a kind of mixed up, blended mess of where you might find electrons. So that is the electron cloud model, the modern and probably weirdest model of the atom that we have yet come up with.